Okay. Are we ready? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Rena Dechter to uh, present to us on probabilistic reasoning meets heuristic search. Uh, Rena and I have known each other for several decades, I guess. Um, we have both worked in the field that is sort of at the intersection of operations research, statistics, and computer science. And anybody who's been in any of those fields recognizes that to make real progress today in any of those fields, you need to know a little bit about the other fields. And Rena has been really instrumental in helping that to happen. Um, I have her bio here, and there's a long list of like great accomplishments that I could read to you, but you can read it on the seminar announcement yourself. Uh, she's the uh, what professor? The Chancellor's Professor of Computer Science at UC Irvine, and um, has been uh, uh, a really a driving force behind the evolution of probabilistic methods and constraint processing and search in artificial intelligence. Thank you, Rena. Thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I think the last time I was here was maybe five, six years ago. Uh, I am now spending my sabbatical uh, at the University of Maryland, and I live in DC, so I'm uh, taking the opportunity to visit universities in the area, and it's really great to be here. Um, I will talk uh, about uh, the title of the paper, how uh, heuristic search can help probabilistic reasoning. Normally, people don't think about search when they think about probabilistic reasoning. So this will be my message. But before I will do that, and let's see if it works. Down. 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 It was working. It was working. OK, buddy, what do we do now? Trying to see. So before uh, I'm delving into it, let's talk about what's going on in AI a little bit. So there is a renaissance, ah, I need to stand here. So there is a renaissance these days in AI and uh, huge progress in areas including deep learning, <coughs> learning and probabilistic models. And <coughs> There are differences between what uh, is performed by this learning, deep learning. All the uh, deep learning is able to really do fast prediction, while probabilistic models are a little bit slower in their reasoning. Uh, deep learning is sort of corresponds to the cognitive processes that are uh, identified by uh, cognitive scientists like Kahneman, that he identified the uh, human thinking as being either system one, which is fast and uh, really uh, intuitive, like face recognition, versus uh, system two, which is slow and deliberative, is what we do when we prove theorems, when we do planning. So, corresponding to these two uh, uh, cognitive processes, we can think about the deep learning and the learning ideas generating fast state thinking while. Uh, model-free uh, objects allowing you predictions. And uh, on the other hand, in the, in the probabilistic models in the other system, you have uh, ability to do some logical, deliberative reasoning. You have models. Uh, one thing that allows the really uh, amazing progress in deep learning is all the tools that were developed that make it uh, accessible to many people. Likewise, in uh, the area of graphical models, people are trying to build tools such as probabilistic prog programming languages and Markov logic. Markov logic is an example. This progress is uh, going on, but uh, the, the ability of using those systems is not as easy as in the uh, learning area, and uh, this is why these uh, uh, tools, there is a lot of development in trying to really further those tools. <coughs> so uh, what I will talk about today is on the probabilistic model side, and one aspect that I want to emphasize is the fact that we really need models. Graphical models are all about modeling the world, and just quoting uh, a wise man in the area just recently said, if a machine does not have a model of reality, you cannot expect the machine 
to behave intelligently in that reality. So as much as we are excited in uh, deep learning, uh, we know in AI, and the uh, issue is really uh, debated and discussed all the time, we need models, we need also to capture the uh, thinking that people are doing. So uh, this is just, I don't know why it's twice. I, okay. So let me move to what I'm planning to talk today. This is the outline. I will present to you what the graphical models are. Uh, and we'll talk primarily on, given a model, how do we do the reasoning in the model, and trying to emphasize principles and, and generality across many uh, models that can fall underneath this uh, framework that we call graphical models, whether they are holistic or not. So the two, uh, uh, what you see, the, uh, oops, uh, what you see, I'm trying to point, this is the pointer, the top. Uh, I'm trying to point, where is the pointer? Oh, so they, I, these pictures that you see here at the bottom are trying to capture the, uh, the motivation or, or the uh, overview of my talk. Uh, on the right, you see we are talking about problems that are hard. All of them are NP-hard, and I will focus on the methods that we will use. The design, this on the right represents what we are, what is the goal in our computation. The goal cannot be just to solve a problem exactly because the problems are hard. So the goal is to generate any time algorithms that improve me with time, and also, sorry, I, uh, okay, and also provide some confidence in through us. This is our goal. Uh, the way to achieve this goal is to focus on major, se several paradigms that, and combine them together. And this is what I will elaborate on. And uh, I will talk about these two <laughs> methods, uh, inference and, and search, uh, in particular, and variational bands, and how to combine them and conclude. So what, is a, what are graphical models? Graphical models is a way of ex, uh, expressing a large uh, a complex system using a collection of local functions over small variables. That's the essence. So what you specify is these functions over small subsets of variables. For example, you can have uh, these variables and this function, and taking them all together uh, represent the global information on which we want to reason. Uh, more formally, you ha we have these triplet variables. We assume we will talk about discrete variables, domains, and functions or factors, as they call it. For example, these are we have uh, for, uh, this here these three functions, and a function is we assume a table on the variables. So in this example, you have these two functions. These are the values, and the product is our global function, and we use graphs to capture the information, to abstract the information, and I will talk about this in more detail in this slide, because the graph is really important. And please stop me anytime if you have questions. So we visualize a graphical model, just the, the functions and their scopes by a primal graph. The primal graph uh, associate uh, variables with nodes, and factors or functions with clicks. So if I have this example of four functions and if they are combined in these particular examples into a global function by summation rather by, than by multiplication, this will be the primal graph. Every click is connected here like ABD. That's all. That's the graph that, I mean, it, uh, that is so powerful to give us a start uh, at, at many of the methods that we will see. Now we ask a variety of questions and there are many examples of use of graphical models. In, uh, in bioinformatics, for example, there are many applications. Uh, in the case of uh, protein uh, 3D uh, predictions or protein design, we can capture the uh, different amino acids that uh, we need to really locate as variables and their values and the interaction between adjacent amino acids uh, using functions. This gives rise to a, sometimes an energy function. And in order to really predict the, uh, the, the 3D shape of the protein, it amounts to 
finding a minimization or a maximization of this global function. So it can be, the global function can be a product and uh, we may find a maximization, uh, uh, which is this. And we call this task map and its optimization task over the global function. Uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in vision, in, uh, in, in the task of segmentation, when we have an image, uh, what we want is to be able to predict what, what part of the scenes belong to what object. So it is possible to, uh, uh, to uh, model the problem using conditional, what is called in the community conditional random field. Uh, we ha will have, we can associate with each <coughs> pixel in the image uh, a variable which will assign it the object it belongs to and use the evidence which will be the red, glue, glue, green, blue from the, uh, from the image and by trying to figure out what is the most likely object associated with each, ob with each uh, pixel, we can try to uh, perform the task. So in this case, the, we can formalize this problem as summation or mar marginalization. Again, the product of the function will give us the, a probability distribution. And in order to compute the, the likelihood, we will have to perform a summation task uh, over the variables. So the formally, uh, this task is uh, associated with summation rather than optimization. And partition function day is well known concept that we uh, often people want to compute when you have graphical model, models. And also, uh, it's possible that one of the graphical models that uh, 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 is uh, uh, no, well known is even for making decision under uncertainties. This graphical model here in this example is called influence diagram. And in addition to having random variables, these are the, uh, depicted here, we also have actions and rewards. And here the task is a little bit different. The task here is to find a maximum over all the actions. We want to maximize the policy. Uh, that, uh, to, to find the policy that will maximize the expected uh, reward. So if we try to translate this task into uh, a formally, it will involve uh, what we call marginal map is an example of this mixed uh, inference. We will again have this function, uh, but we will have to sum over some of the variables and to maximize over others. And this give rise to a, uh, a third uh, task of our graphical models. So, if we want just to focus ourselves uh, on probabilistic graphical models, these are max inference, some inference, mixed inference are three uh, popular tasks and they are all difficult. Uh, some of them reduced to combinatorial optimization, some of them reduced to counting. And the one that is uh, associated with uh, a mixed inference is the hardest one. Uh, but it generalizes those other tasks. And on this, this is currently our focus. So what is it that we want? That now that we want that everything is hard, I am probably all the time out of the no. camera, that's fine. <laughs> OK. Uh, uh, we cannot solve the problem exactly. We want the following. We want to have uh, <coughs> bounds. But uh, we don't, don't want just to generate <coughs> some upper and lower bounds. We want to generate bounds that will improve if we have more time. In that sense, we, need, we will also want a solution that will improve in time, but incomplete. In, uh, we also want this uh, bound to get tighter and tighter. So that is what we uh, desire to have. And this is in order to be able uh, to be responsive to the user, meaning these days we always interact with the user. It's important to really uh, be tuned to what the user wants. So the user can terminate. Oops. Uh, sorry. Uh, going back. OK. No, I, I thought I will have another line. It doesn't appear. But the user can um, interrupt the computation at any time and get as an, uh, uh, in response, get the current bound on its solution. And also we want to be able, if we have enough time, if we have enough memory, to get to the exact solutions. So that's what we wish to have. 
How we, would we do it? We will look at the three major paradigms for uh, uh, approximate reasoning. So we are in the framework of approximate reasoning, and the three paradigms are variational method, Monte Carlo sampling methods, and heuristic search. Uh, they have different properties and different ability to deal with each one of these desired properties. Uh, in variational method, we can uh, reason about small uh, subsets of variables. In Monte Carlo sampling, we use randomization and we are able to estimate averages over the whole search space. And in search, we, we know search, search can be, uh, give us a full solution, but we can stop it at any time. We have a guarantee, a deterministic guarantee about what is going on. What? I just wanted to get yes. the air out of my words. Uh, what do you mean is uh, responsive? Responsive to the user. Namely, we would like to uh, like to develop methods that can tell the algorithm stop now, terminate now, give me the best answer that you can now. Yes, it will give me a number and it will say, if I'm looking for an optimal solution, let's say, okay. it will say what is the best solution it found now, and it even will tell me uh, what is the error, a bound on the error that I made <coughs> at this time. And in the, uh, uh, yeah, in, in the colors, uh, you mean? I, the colors, re ignore the colors. I Red, red means it's stronger than uh, uh, the color. Um, green uh, is bad, green is good. Right? Yeah, yeah. Red is uh, yeah. So uh, <coughs> don't, I don't want to elaborate, but it it, it emphasizes the good properties, and red is get, uh, good, uh, green is less good, and complete, and uh, yellow is the the least uh, good. Uh, uh, we will talk more about that when I will talk about each one, but the emphasis is we want these three properties and they are obeyed differently by this, this method. It's, it's a, an intuitive argument. It's not really a formal argument at this point. Uh, but we want, uh, there is a de definitely a, a, a very a clear difference between the, the sampling methods and the other two. And we and what I will do next and is for the, for the yeah. variational methods. When you say you reason over a small subset, it means that you ignore some of the density structure in the. I'm ignoring the some. Of, I will talk about it. I, I mean uh, uh, variable elimination algorithms and decomposition bounds, things that reason about small subset of the functions and are trying to make uh, sense of it, like belief propagation, generalized belief propagation. These methods. Uh, um, and uh, that's what I will elaborate on. So, <coughs> so what I, the idea is to combine approaches, and here is a, a, the picture uh, that we have again, and how we think the, uh, the, these two methods can feed each other. So, uh, and also some of some keywords that can uh, uh, ground you in what I mean by that. What we will see is that. Uh, we can, uh, uh, these variational methods can feed both uh, search by generating heuristic that will guide search, and they can feed into sampling method by generating good proposals, uh, if you're doing both in sampling. And in addition, this search and sampling can <coughs> be uh, combined uh, as well and feed each other. What I will talk today primarily is about this bond between variational methods and search, and at, at towards the end I will say one or two words about where most of my work, uh, work now is here actually, uh, in, this area, in this area. And for all these methods, the graph would be a general unifying concept that will guide those methods. Uh, so now I would like uh, to elaborate out a little bit more and maybe uh, more precisely in, on one graphical model, which is the Bayesian network, uh, and uh, uh, emphasize the notion of graph. So um, this is uh, medical diagnostic is one of the earliest example. Uh, this example is one of the earliest examples for medical diagnosis. Uh, you have some causal relationship between uh, variable smoking, lung cancer, bronchitis, and result of x-ray and some uh, uh, manifestation, and we want to capture the, the probability between all these variables, so it's enough 
uh, what we can specify if these are uh, 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 more or less causal relationship or a co a correlational relationship, we can se specify for each variable the probability, its probability condition on its parents in the graph. And this is a, an example of such a specification. So we will have the probability of D given a, on the combination of value for C and B, assuming zero, one values. And if you have these five functions, one with associated with each variable, and you take their product, so these are the local functions in our, you get a joint probability distribution, and you define the base, the Bayesian network. And now we can ask, since we have joint probability distribution, we can ask, optimization query, summation query, we can ask the belief, what is the probability that D equals zero but, and, and, and execute it by summation, or we can try to find some optimal configuration on the variables given a value, and so on. So this is one, if, in your mind, uh, uh, throughout the talk, this would be one uh, primary uh, graphical model that I'm thinking about, but also Markov networks, and e everything is applicable uh, throughout uh, the graphical model scene. And the main thing is we can combine those uh, functions in general. Uh, we can, we have another operator uh, for asking our queries, which in this, it can be summation or maximization, while to combine the function we have here, product. And to illustrate the power, or the power of uh, Bayesian network in the early days was uh, illustrated by a graph like that, that shows that you can express a function on 37 variables, a probability distribution, with just 500 parameters instead of all that because we have the graph. Uh, just to show you graphs, 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 examples, so we can continue to, and see that graphs from different applications. This is a, from a constraint problem and so on. So there are many graphs and obviously this is a tool we should explore. It's the first tool and not the only tool, but it gives us uh, power. So I will now talk about the first uh, method, which is inference and variation method. And variable elimination, if you didn't hear about them, uh, and this is your first time, that's it's okay. Uh, suppose we want now uh, to really, we have this, to really perform this summation. We know that because uh, we can sum uh, one variable at a time and just focus on, on functions uh, that are associated with the variable. So this leads to a, an algorithm that is called bucket elimination. Uh, we will put, uh, we have the graph, we will put only functions with B in them. We are summing first on B uh, and we'll sum them. Uh, and then the results we will put, we will put as a function, uh, since it mentions C in another bucket and uh, we will perform now the product and summation of, uh, and eliminate C, and we will generate another function that will be uh, involved D, so now we will sum over D, and sum over E is uh, evidence, and uh, mm -hmm. we'll, uh, at the end, when we uh, sum over A, we will j get the evidence, the probability that E equals zero, and uh, we can also get uh, the conditional probability of A given E, which is what we wanted to compute at the beginning, this expression we get at the, uh, at the first bucket. And this whole process, its complexity is governed by this parameter, graph parameter that it, we call induced width, that is known as induced width, it's also known as tree width. Uh, so uh, this graph here, what we want to capture in the complexity is how many variables you have to process in each bucket, uh, and uh, the computation is definitely exponential in that number. And this number can be uh, observed by looking at the ordered graph and uh, seeing how many back arcs you have going back. And uh, in this graph, we have also to connect the parents, and also, and and, and that's. I will elaborate an, uh, on it later on, but. This whole computation is time and space exponential in the induced width of the ordering plus one. And everything is immediately transferable if you want to do optimization. If you want to do optimization, just instead of do some, doing summation, do maximization. The functions look the same, the complexity is the same. And this is the computation now. And uh, here we also can decode and find the value by uh, 
consulting the functions that, that these functions are no, known also as cost to flow in optimization, it's dynamic programming, uh, and we can just generate the optimal solution by going from bottom to top in a greedy fashion consulting the function. Uh, we'll not get into the details, but we just do it easily. And that's really wonderful to get an answer. So this algorithm is governed by this uh, uh, graph parameter that's called induced width uh, or tree width. Uh, for different ordering, we will have different induced width. Finding the optimal one is hard, but we can set <coughs> with the algorithm that give you good orderings. I will not get into that here. There is a lot of research in uh, how to find good tree width uh, in the graph community, <coughs> graph community, and it's a well-known problem, and that this concept impact computation uh, uh, everywhere. So, uh, if we are, so it, since we are talking about a, a wonderful algorithm, but it has a, uh, a problem, the problem is the memory, first of all. You cannot execute this algorithm if the induced speed is about 20, 21, just no memory. Uh, so we have to do approximation, and uh, here come a simple approximation that we call mini bucket. But I will just illustrate this first when uh, noting that this computation that I showed you can also be viewed as if it is computed over a tree. Uh, so we can think, if this is our example, we can think as if we are grouping the functions uh, based on uh, variables into really buckets, but now we see explicitly that there is some kind of a tree below them. And now we send messages. The message that I show you can be viewed, this elimination of a variable can be viewed as messages over this tree of clusters. And uh, again, the computation is depending on, depend on the number of variables in a cluster. So if we don't have enough time and memory, what we, we, we can do, we can say, ah, we cannot group more than two or three variables. And if we have a very big cluster, we will di uh, divide it into two mini buckets. But th thereafter, we are doing the same thing. We are just, uh, this is just assignment of the function. And now we are sending messages, but the messages will be thinner. So the, the message here has only one variable in its scope <coughs> instead of two. And likewise, uh, I think here we have one variable in, instead of two. And in general, you, this I bound that you force will uh, make sure that you don't have more than I variables in the messages. And this is a way to bound memory and time. So that's the mini bucket idea. And uh, to elaborate a little bit more, what it takes, it takes a collection of function. And what we want to compute this creature here, which is take the product take the product of everything and maximize over a variable. And instead, we are dividing into two mini buckets and doing the computation separately and then combine. And this reduced compu a computation, obviously, but also we know it generates a lower bound if it's a maximization, and upper bound if it's a minimization. So it's not an arbitrary. We, we know something. It's a bound. Uh, and so this leads in all our tasks to a really a way a starting point for oh, what did they do? Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the ability to have this anytime look alike. I mean, if the I bound is uh, small, we, it, we will get answer fast, uh, but it will be bad. And as the I, as we increase the I bound that we allow, we get better and better results. Like, uh, complexity is time and space exponentially in I. We get lower and upper bound, but we want any time, but it's not really fully any time, because when memory does not allow you, you cannot increase the alpha. So you will not be able to get all the way to a, a, an exact answer. So it's good, but it can improve. So now we want to tighten the bound. And uh, uh, so there is dual decomposition uh, uh, methods were very well known. One, uh, and the, actually the mini bucket is an example because when you partition a bucket, it's as if you duplicate the variables. So <coughs> uh, here we have an example. We can just partition, uh, duplicate the variables and have a decomposition. And we know, I mean, here I call the function theta, that what we want to compute is bounded by this. But we can do better by adjusting the cost 
basically cost shifting. This is a well-known idea. We don't change the, the global function because we are, are uh, adding functions that their totality is zero, but they are changing the relative cost that you have here uh, using these local functions. And we can now write what we have with the global function is the same cost, but we can minimize for this cost shifting and get a much tighter bound. And there are a host of methods. This is called, uh, we bound the solution using the composition method. Uh, it's again a bound, and we can, uh, it's a kind of reparameterization, and it leads to algorithms that are, uh, look like um, a message passing algorithm. Uh, some of them are one pass message passing, like the mini bucket, some of them are iterative, and we give you better tightening. So the picture is uh, that uh, here is an illustration of what uh, can go on empirically. We had the mini bucket. We have mini bucket, what we call moment matching, where we do this cost shifting a little bit, just one pass, uh, as dictated by the computation. I didn't show you the details. And we can do it iteratively until it's, uh, con it converges and we get really the minimum, the best cost shifting methods. So, um, and these are how we can look at it. It can be, at, it's called also cost shifting. Uh, and we can improve our estimate either by improving, uh, increasing the I bound, as you see here in these two examples for pedigree domain. So, but if we do moment matching once in one iteration, we immediately, with a little bit of time, we are getting much better result. And if we allow iterative computation, namely a month, more and more time to tighten it more and more, you can see how things improve. So this cost shifting and mini bucket give us a tool for trying to figure out where we want to be, how much time we want to spend, and uh, somehow to control that. So to summarize, uh, we can, uh, there is another aspect, uh, uh, if, we, if we are thinking about summation, Queries. There is another way of improving our bonds by uh, using a holder inequality, and this leads to what we call weighted mini bucket. Uh, it gives us another parameter, W, that the summation that we are doing is what's called power sum, and this parameter can improve uh, and tighten our bonds even more and be incorporated really uh, naturally in this. So. If I add uh, the pros and cons uh, for this uh, whole uh, system, it's uh, the we can bound the computation. It gives us upper and lower bound. Uh, the cost shifting and the holder inequality really improve, uh, but it's not really any time, not fully any time. So we can use it to some extent, mm -hmm. up to a point. So now I will talk about the other key, which is end or search. Uh, uh, in graphical models. Search, it's obvious what to do. We can always define variables and uh, we have the variables and their values. We can uh, uh, describe all the configuration of the model in a simple search tree. And we can use it to try to do the computation. So, but we, uh, this is a, a full configuration will be a path in this tree. And we can define the notion of a value of a node. The value of a node will be uh, related to the subtree below it. It will be the optimal solution below the node. If we are talking about optimization, it will be the total sum of functions below that node, and so on. So this is often what we want to compute recursively over trees. But this tree is not really a good, good starting point because it's really exponential. So one of the observations uh, uh, that was made a decade or so ago is that we can even have a better search spaces that can uh, consider the structure of the graph. So let's think for the sake of this example, uh, you have these local functions. These are the local functions. And let's uh, think about uh, summation and minimization. Uh, so this is the combination, this is optimization. This is the, the brute force search space. 
But look at this structure. We can organize it into a pseudo tree. It's the same tree, uh, the same graph, but uh, a directed tree. And it captures the fact uh, that if we assign A and B a value, this subproblem and this subproblem are completely independent. Namely, in this pseudo tree, we do not allow any arcs that cross between branches. And if we observe that, now we can lay the surface along this pseudo tree. And we will have what we call and or tree. So A and B, uh, we, A is an or, or node, its value is an and node. Up to this level, it's the usual tree. But after assigning A and B a value, we have two subproblems, one rooted at C and one rooted at E. So this would be an end node. These two can be solved in parallel. And then we continue with the values. Uh, we have only branching, one branching here. And this will be for every assignment to A and E. So obviously, this whole search tree is smaller than this whole search tree. It has only four. 54 end not namely corresponding to assignment, and we can do that and save a lot. What will we save? We will be exponential in the height of the tree and not in the number of variables. But we can do even better just by looking at the graph, and this is only looking at the graph. We can observe that every variable has a context. The context of a variable is uh, tells us what variables uh, in its uh, what ancestor variables impact the subtree below it. So, uh, uh, for example, E is dependent on E and A, but not on B. It's really uh, B is irrelevant to the search tree below E. So, and we can look, compute this context uh, from the graph for each node, and it will lead to a graph. We can compact the search tree into a search graph by noting that certain subtrees are the same. They are, they are not dependent on a particular variable, value of the variables. And this immediately gives us even more compact search space. And we call this one context minimal and or graph. In this particular example, it's the smallest. It's always the smallest. And here it's highlighted. And we, we should always, it seems, operate in this graph because it's the smallest. But as we will see, this also implies that we have to use memory. When we have an end or tree and we search it, we don't have to use memory. We can do the extra search. But when we have a graph, if we want to capitalize on uh, subtrees, we have to remember stuff. Uh, and this computation, or, or the size, just the size of these trees are dependent on these parameters that we uh, observed er earlier. So we have all tree and end or tree, all graph and end or graph. Here, end or graph, its size is, it's easy to show, it's uh, bounded again by the tree width, by the induced width. Uh, if it's all graph, it's path width, if you are familiar with that. If it's a tree, if we don't have that, we have, uh, we have to bound by the height only. And it's the well-known relationship between the two. And now we just define a search space on which we can perform all these computations. And uh, towards the end, I will show how we do it for the marginal map, these mixed queries. But uh, to give a little bit more details, I only show you the structure. How we do? A, what is the? How do we get the numbers associated with the function? So it, we can from the tables we can uh, spread numbers on the arcs in a, in a particular way, and a solution. Now it will be a solution tree. It's not a path. Uh, it's just a product of all the arcs uh, on the path. And uh, uh, we can now, when we are doing the computation, uh, so the cost of this. Uh, configuration is, is uh, the, the product here. And when we do uh, a, a, a computation of the value, remember the value is there, uh, let's say if we are computing probability of evidence, it's summation, the task is to do some summation. For each uh, variable, we will compute its values based on the, on the values computed by uh, the child nodes. So, um, uh, for n node, we will do product of the children. For all node, it will be summation. This is easy to really uh, figure out. 
And just by traversing these three depths for search, we can compute this figure here at the top on the tree. And if we have a graph, we have also to keep some computation on the side so that we will not have to do it twice. This is the memory that we will have to keep. And again, I mean, now the pseudotrees, uh, if they are, you can have many pseudotrees in the same sense that you could have many orderings of the variables and different induced width. So here is three pseudotrees of this particular graph. Some of them have smaller height. Uh, the width, uh, uh, we, we can also define the width on this uh, pseudotree. Chains, which are the regular search space, is just a special case of that. And obviously we would want a pseudotree that is, has a small height and that has small width. We have this relationship that is well known uh, between the height and the induced width, free width. I think I skipped something, let's see. Ah, this, just, this is slide is just to show you this issue with the pseudotree that uh, if I have this graphical model, now I'm talking about graphs only, it can have this pseudotree, it can have this pseudotree. What you hear, see here is context, the notion of context. This is one search and or search graph, this is another, and it's still a question where should we be? Uh, we, should we optimize the induced width? Should we optimize the height? Uh, it's not always clear, uh, but uh, we have this, it, it gives rise to these uh, uh, graph problems that uh, um, we can uh, study. So I, <coughs> I talked about these two methods, and now I will show you how we can combine them and how we can apply them to real search, marginal map. So it's simple. What we can do is use whatever bounds we found here as pre-compiled or not pre-compiled, but we use normally pre-compiled heuristics for search. So search, heuristic search is one of the oldest and most popular this, uh, problem solving ideas for planning in AI and people are generating the heuristics somehow mechanically. And this is a way of generating the heuristic mechanically and also because we have these bounds, high bounds, the level of cost shifting and all that, we have a way of controlling how much we want to invest in order to get good heuristics and the trade-off is really a major question. Uh, and uh, <coughs> we can uh, use it for all the tasks that we discussed. So let's see very quickly what, what is going on here. So if this is a regular search tree, I mean, the, the principle extends to end all very uh, easily. Uh, we want, what is the heuristic function? It's an estimate of the value below a node. And normally it's a lower bound if it's minimization, but it doesn't have to be, normally that's what it is. So how we, what uh, we can show <laughs> is that this, if this are, is a mini bucket execution along the variable ordering, these are functions that are generated, <laughs> Then we can, if we are uh, assigned two values to the, these two variables and we want to compute this age of the extension, we can look up, we can show that we can look up these two functions in the bucket of D and this function that was generated uh, and this will, this sum will be our, uh, an estimate for the, uh, the heuristic. Uh, so if we are familiar with the jargon of search, there is H, there is G, so we can make the, the correspondence and we can talk about a star type of algorithm, branch and bound type of algorithm. When, they are, we, when at each node we will compute, we will do table lookup to compute the heuristic and what, is, what we have here, if it's good, we will have better heuristic, if it's less good, we will have weaker heuristic. And we want to really, we, nowadays we are focusing on marginal map after we uh, apply it to map and, and we are currently applying summation because this is the hardest task. Why look at it? I already noted decision making. When we do decision, we have the actions that we want to maximize and other variables that we want to make, uh, apply summation to. But all, also in general,
What is what? We are really allowing yourself to really talk without uh, a lot of rigor. Uh, but uh, so NP to the PP means, well, uh, it's very hard. <laughs> it's hard the number P. Number, I mean, and now I'm talking, talking very loosely. It's harder than summation by itself, which is very hard, and it's harder than optimization by itself. Ah, so it's the combination is harder than... Uh, it's the, multiple effects rather than yeah. Yeah, you can say that, yeah. Um, so, how do we do it, apply it all to, and why marginal map? We call it marginal map because we do map, optimization, and marginalization. So here is an illustration. If I have this graph, these are the variables I'm interested in. These are the variables I want to sum out. Then it means that I am, I'm an, I am, I must, process the variables in, in a particular order because summation and maximization do not commute. So if I if, uh, generate a pseudo tree for this graph, I have to put these variables at the top of the pseudo tree and the rest at the bottom. And this by itself means I'm restricted, so it's harder because I cannot have the liberty of doing it in the best way. <coughs> So, uh, but after we obey this restriction, we can have the end or graph associated with our pseudo tree. And on the side, we can also generate our bounding heuristic along the same uh, an ordering that is also consistent with this graph. And we can tighten them and so on. And now we can simply do this, uh, um, uh, use the heuristic and do any kind of search algorithm on that. And from this point on, we just go and borrow all the tools performed by people in heuristic search. And just to uh, jump ahead, uh, we, uh, we are working on this methodology since 2006, seven, uh, eight, nine, and we have primarily optimization, combinatorial optimization algorithms. Uh, and in the recent year, we are focused on focusing on summation and on the marginal map. There are competitions that we won, uh, and uh, there was even one on marginal map that we uh, solvers were either first or second. But let's continue. So this is just bragging a little bit. Uh, uh, and uh, so our work on solver for marginal map uh, started in 2014. There are a bunch of papers. So what do we do? We bring in ideas like how much time do I have? We bring in ideas from heuristic search. One, one idea is wait, to wait uh, to really multiply the heuristic by a, a constant and get a answer faster if you do best for search, if you do a star algorithm. Uh, but the answer is bounded. Uh, it will not be optimal. It will be uh, this W. It's not the same W away from the optimal solution. And there are a variety of algorithms that we applied in our case that we uh, experimented with. Then we also uh, looked at the combination of best first search and depth first search. So depth first search, as you know, branch and bound, will go and find a solution and the solution will be This will give you a lower bound if you are doing maximization. But best first search, which is, uh, can improve the heuristic evaluation function, will give you an upper bound if you only learn it and an answer only towards the end. So our idea is to interleave these two methods in order to get upper and lower bound. And there are two ways that we did it. One is called look ahead, uh, going in with best first and diving in depth first. Another is to alternate these two in a, in a, in a sophisticated way. And these are the, so the, these two, two algorithm resulted, uh, are the resulting algorithm for the marginal map. And let me show you just one slide about the uh, type of results we are getting on benchmarks. So we have here the weighted algorithm that we experimented with and these two algorithms. And when we experiment, then we limit the, uh, the pre computation of the weighted mini bucket to 20 minutes by something. Mm -hmm. And we also limit the memory by something. Uh, so, and what we see here, two results on two, uh, three problem instances when the left is when the heuristic is weaker. The I bound is 12. On the right, the heuristic is, uh, is uh, stronger. The I bound is 18. And 
At the top you see the upper bounds, they're generated as the function of time, and they are tighter, only the tighter heuristic, even if it's not easy to see immediately. And the bottom are the lower bounds, typically they are generating by whenever we find a solution. So you can see that we have this property of convergence to something at any time. This is definitely any time. We, if we have enough time, we'll find the exact answer. So this is a quick delve into that. Uh, and just one slide about our next step. What you saw in this marginal map, we solved each summation problem, condition summation problem exactly. That was the previous results. This fails if the, if the summation problem is hard. We, uh, we cooked the problem to have easy conditional sum problem in order to execute them. Uh, we wanted to do better, so we introduced now is a place where we want to look at sampling. Uh, and in particular, when I'm not talking about it, there is a weighted mini bucket important sampling algorithm developed by Eiler and Liu and some people in 2015. It's important sampling algorithm that use the weighted mini bucket function as uh, proposals and give and allow us to develop also probabilistic bound of the results after uh, given the number of samples that we have. So it, uh, uh, it <coughs> generate, uh, it, it takes this function, it generate, uh, a, 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 when, it, when it samples a variable in an important sampling way from bottom to top, then this would be the, the proposal. I will not get into it, but the, the nice thing about it is that we can have a bound. So we now exploit this algorithm in our marginal map. And when we get to a summation problem, this is only the maximization variable, we are using this sampling idea. And we get out of it a probabilistic bound given some confidence. We can show that uh, the, the our results is bounded away by this expression from the exact one, and here we have the, the, the weighted mini bucket and other parameters and the number of samples. And we, we can derive a probabilistic bound on our result as, as a result. And it will give us far better, first of all, we can solve. We can solve, no? Uh, I, I, I'm quite almost done. And done. Uh, it gives us, uh, it gives us a ability to solve this problem that we were unable to solve. What you can see, this there are two algorithms. The new algorithms that we have here uh, denoted uh, these two stochastic algorithms, and. Here we have a results on 150 grid problems. This is, these are averages, and we are computing accuracy. And there is My some. Can you go back? So I have this problem across two days ago. Just leave it for this Just leave it? Okay. So I have oh, this problem. Okay. So I have this Go ahead. Sorry. Okay, so these are sto this algorithm that has this stochastic element in them. Uh, they are we can we compute for each one of them the distance to some it's L star is either the exact if we know it or some the best bound that we found and we average this accuracy for lower bound for upper bound and you can see so the lowest is the better so you can see these two are best which are the new algorithm far better than the deterministic ones. And also here, this is another algorithm that uh, we developed, uh, and definitely we have results that we couldn't have. So uh, I hope I showed you that uh, these three, I mean, I only touched for two minutes about sampling, uh, that, uh, but uh, we have several works that are focusing on that, so we can do. Uh, and, uh, so we have these two methods of inference and variational methods in search, and when we combine them as, and use the uh, uh, mini bucket values or the variational method either for sampling as proposal or for as heuristics for search, this really is a powerful tool. Um, and the, our continuing work is to really <coughs> continue to iterate between these three paradigms and to allow them to fit each other 
Okay? And in order to also um, improve both the heuristic and also the search can improve, continue to improve the proposals and so on. So we have several papers. And let me uh, thank my, all my collaborators, the people who really uh, uh, collaborate on this particular work, uh, Alex Eiler, Adu Marinesco, John Q, and Chi. Uh, they are, I hope I highlight this is Alex, this is Jun Q. She is not here, and this is Adu. And these are all my students uh, so far. Uh, and thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? So, my question. So, the, the, the search you have shown is all binary search, right? What do you mean by binary? Uh, the diagrams you showed 0, 1, most No, no, it, uh, it's a domain can be any number. It can be any number. It's not about the term. No, no, just no. no. But it can be continuous as well. It's right? not, it, no. It's discrete. discrete. It's discrete. It's discrete. Okay. Not, not binary. No, not binary. So what happens in continuous? Uh, uh, continuous is a very important question that we are not dealing with. Uh, to deal with continuous variables, we need to, uh, to do something else. Oh, uh, well, a straightforward thing that people did is to discretize the domain. So you can discretize the domain and, and continue. but. Uh, it requires far more serious mm -hmm. methods. People are working on that. Sampling is one way. So sampling uh, the domain, that, that's definitely uh, an approach that is taken by people who are actually practicing these methods in robotics and so on. So and I think this is the way to go, sampling the domain. Yeah. So there are, uh, there are a lot of ways that people use to simplify both knowledge elicitation and inference in probabilistic graphical models that can't be expressed in the graph, what you call the uh, primal graph. So context specific independence, independence of causal influence, those kinds of, of methods that can be exploited both for learning and inference. Have you looked at exploiting those in your algorithms? Yeah, so um, that's definitely necessary. Uh, for instance, one, one type of context specific independence or uh, is type of constraints. When you have constraints, I mean, definitely there is a, a lot of dead ends. So these five probabilities are all equal? Yeah, or, 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 or zero. It's a special yeah. case. Zero all is a special case. They, zero is a special case. And uh, definitely, if we want to solve problems that uh, involve hard constraints, we we have to incorporate constraint propagation ideas, and right. this is a way of handling. This is so one, one, one uh, very common method for specific, specifying conditional probability tables with a lot of parents is to use a tree. Yeah. yeah. And can you look at those trees as well? Yes. So we can, search is very flexible for any specification. Mm -hmm. uh, to generate the heuristic is less uh, and flexible. So variable elimination ideas or all this really need, the, you can do it. So the, it was done uh, uh, using a, uh, decision trees and decision graph to perform all this manipulation. We have done it to some extent and others uh, like in uh, Craig Boutillier at the time and they, they show that you can do from a mark of decision process, you can do some of this when the input is specified as decision trees. Our exp our experience with that is that, and it's limited, uh, trees, that it's not, it's less effective. Mm -hmm. But it's only because we, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not conclusive on that. I mean, we assume if you can convert the decision tree to table and the table is manageable, there is something in the manipulation of table that is so quick, that is so easier than the manipulation of these decision trees that when you have to access everything, uh, uh, explicitly. But I don't think this is uh, uh, the end of the story. It depends how the input comes to you. So in probabilistic programming languages, the input is always as if then else, which will mean it's decision tree-like. It's not table-like. And we worked a little bit uh, with Avi Pfeffer on this uh, and, uh, in Figaro. And uh, we, we went through the one, one route where, where they take their program and they convert it to table for us. So we can apply al our algorithms are uh, coded, uh, assuming tables. And we saw the results, it's, it's not that good. 
It's not that good that we have to do the conversion because often it's very big, unnecessarily big because of this. So I think definitely it's necessary to really think about this alternative specification. We are thinking about that and to see how some of these methods can be done efficiently. In principle, it's possible, but the question empirically is how good it is. Yes, it's important though. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you have any insight on how this method can apply to the following problem. It's kind of optimization over a gray box simulation, meaning that you have a computational graph starting with not necessarily discrete but continuous variables. And you have computational nodes which are arithmetic operators, but some of the nodes happen to be black box functions. And uh, so any insight. So it seems that you have one of my PhD students working on this problem that this paradigm of going to the variational methods search, but it's a lot of gradient-based search and sampling, right, uh, are working together. But any insight how the techniques you describe may be maybe beneficial for this problem? Uh, I've thought about it uh, a little bit. Uh, I think the, the main question would be the variation of the thoughts. To do the search or the sampling, you consult the black box and it gives you something. You don't have to know the inside of the black box, right? That's the idea. I think uh, uh, the only, I mean, this is from the top of my head, is that to use a sampling in order to uncover a little bit of the box and to estimate the box by something. I don't, I mean, that would be my first try. To really and try to understand what's in the box by some kind of sampling method and uh, have a small graphical model approximating it in order to do the variational method. But I, I didn't think about it enough, but I think it's a, it's a problem. I, I, I will let I, another problem with our methods is, for instance, for planning. Uh, if we want to apply it to a planning uh, market decision process, uh, a partially observable one, then you have an horizon. Normally, people in planning are not uh, unfolding. The, the, uh, we have dynamic basin network, which we explicitly unfold the, ba the basin network in each time step uh, for, ta for many time horizons. If we do that, it's not that efficient. So that would be a way for us to apply our methods to computing uh, a policy uh, in plane. Uh, but it doesn't work that well because the, the model becomes huge. And uh, people in plane don't do that. What they do is, I mean, in addition to the, fa to the fact that they are doing things only greedily and they don't, do not compute anything optimally or any time or anything, uh, they are just generating those heuristics on the fly. When they are, and they, so uh, they are looking ahead but they, are, they don't have this explicit representation of the whole model. And uh, I think this is, a, the, this is a, a, a challenge for us that we, uh, to really exploit everything, the need to generate the UIS, that's the bottleneck, the need to generate this uh, approximation. If we have to do it in a pre-compiled way, it requires sometimes uh, a problem. And if we do it on the fly, which we can in principle, uh, empirically, so far, we didn't pay off. So, doing it dynamically is the way. But there is an overhead. And Thank you. I need, I need to look up first time, but let's see. Yes, we can. Okay, let's see. 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 Let's see.